how do we know whether a redox reaction is going to be spontaneous or feasible? Well, if we take the reaction between zinc and copper ions, we could arrange it so that it forms an electrochemical cell, split it up into two half cells, link them together, and my E cell value, if it is positive, or at least greater than zero, then that would tell me that this reaction is indeed spontaneous or feasible. Alternatively, we could look for a negative change in the Gibbs energy. A negative change in Gibbs energy, i.e. a value less than zero, would also tell us that this reaction is feasible or spontaneous. It will therefore come as no surprise that these two terms are linked mathematically. And in this video, I'm going to help you understand the relationship between E cell and Gibbs energy change. I think before we go on, it'd be really useful to recap what we understand about Gibbs energy in this particular context. So the second law of thermodynamics shows that for a process to be spontaneous at constant temperature or pressure, then the total entropy change for that process must be positive. It must be a value that's greater than zero. And we know that the total entropy change for a process is made up in part by the entropy change for the system or the chemical reaction. It's a good way to think about it. And the entropy change of the surroundings because entropy, total entropy is indicating the kind of total entropy change within the universe as a whole, so it's system plus surroundings. Now, we can calculate the entropy change of the surroundings during a chemical reaction. If we go back to our reaction, say, between zinc and copper ions. So if we imagine I've got my beaker, here I've got my copper ions in solution. And I'm going to place in it a piece of zinc or maybe um, a spatula of granulated zinc. Then the reaction that proceeds is exothermic. And that heat is going to be lost to the surroundings, to the beaker, to the air around. The surroundings are so large that they can easily absorb this heat without the temperature or the pressure changing. So if my system is losing heat, then the surroundings will be gaining that heat in exactly the same proportions, because we know from the first law of thermodynamics that energy can't be created or destroyed. So for my system, whatever the entropy sorry, whatever the enthalpy change is, the surroundings, not sure what happened there, the surroundings are going to see the opposite change in heat. So we can pull all that together. So the entropy change of the surroundings, trying not here to get my tongue tied, is equal to minus the heat change divided by the temperature. And this allows us to look at the entropy changes to the surroundings from the point of view of the system, which is where Gibbs energy comes in. Gibbs energy is a convenient way of applying the second law of thermodynamics considering only the properties of the system, and it combines changes in enthalpy with changes in entropy. So delta G is going to be under standard conditions. Minus the temperature multiplied by the change in entropy. Now, if we assume that for a spontaneous reaction, we know that the change in entropy has got to be positive, it's got to be greater than zero, then because this is a negative term, 
That tells me that for a spontaneous or feasible reaction, delta G has got to be a negative value or less than zero. However, what is far more useful for us in terms of thinking about redox reactions is this value of delta G, our Gibbs energy, doesn't just tell us whether a process is spontaneous, but it also tells us the maximum amount of work that our system can do. Because the maximum amount of work that a system can do is the result of the energy that's released as heat. And if we've got a positive change in entropy, energy is essentially drawn from the surroundings, which is also available for work. So we can use delta G to determine the electrical work that could be obtained from a chemical reaction if it was arranged, say, as a battery or a fuel cell in a way that allows us to measure the work or use the energy usefully for doing work. So let's take our zinc half cell and our copper half cell and connect them together to make an electrochemical cell. My zinc half cell is going to be my oxidation or negative half cell. I know that because the standard electropotential for zinc is less positive than that for copper. So zinc atoms are going to be oxidized to form zinc ions plus electrons. And in this cell, because we've replaced the high resistance voltmeter with a motor, the electrons will flow from the zinc half cell to the copper half cell, where they will be used to reduce the copper ions to copper metal. So by replacing the high resistance voltmeter and allowing the electrons to flow, we can actually do useful work with the energy from this chemical reaction. The energy required to transfer charge around a circuit represents the electrical work that the cell can perform. And that charge is equal to the number of moles of electrons produced by the reaction multiplied by the Faraday constant. And the Faraday constant is essentially the charge on one mole of electrons, on one mole of electrons, and it is 96500 coulombs per mole. Charge is given the symbol Q, number of moles of electron are Z, and Faraday's constant is F. I know the number of moles of electrons because if I go back to my equations, um, the zinc going to form Z on 2 plus plus 2 electrons, and 2 electrons are gained by each copper ion, so the number of moles of electrons transferred in this particular example would be 2. Now, it takes one joule of work to move one coulomb of charge through a potential difference of one volt. So let's pull that apart. So electrical work which we're measuring in joules is equal to the negative charge times the potential difference. We're talking here um, about the potential difference between my two half cells. So that essentially is going to be E cell. And it's negative because the system is going to lose energy as it does work. So combining those two equations, we can say that electrical work is equal to the charge, which we know is minus Zf, multiplied by potential difference, which for our reaction is E cell, the maximum potential difference between the half, two half cells. Electrical work comes from the change in Gibbs energy for our cell reaction. So this is the change in 
because as we've just seen, let me write this down, as we've just seen, Gibbs energy uh, combines both entropy and enthalpy to tell us the maximum amount of work that a chemical reaction, in this case our electrochemical cell, can perform. Which means that if our electrical work is our Gibbs energy, delta G is equal to minus number of moles of electrons times the charge on the electron times the potential difference, or E cell. So now we can see how Gibbs energy and E cell are related. Let's finish by looking at a typical exam question. Calculate Gibbs energy for the following reaction using standard electrode potential data. And that would be given in your data sheet or somewhere in the question. So I've got iron 2 ions reacting with silver ions to form iron 3 ions and silver metal. Step one is to figure out which is the oxidation reaction and which is the reduction. So I can see, let's start with silver, that I have Ag plus going to form Ag. So in order to do that, it would need to gain an electron. So standard electrode potential for that half cell is plus 0 0.80 volts. Second half cell, is Fe2 plus going to Fe3 plus. So if I were to look up that half cell, it would look like so. And the standard electrode potential for that one is 0 0.77 volts. So that tells me that because the iron 3, iron 2 half cell has a slightly less positive uh, electrode potential, it is the oxidation half cell, and Fe2 plus is going to be oxidized to Fe3 plus. I also can see that one mole of electrons is transferred. So the first thing to do is to calculate E cell. So E cell is the more positive electrode potential, take away the less positive, which in this case is 0 0.80, take away plus 0.77, which comes out to be plus 0.03 volts. So E cell is telling me that this reaction is feasible because I have a positive value. Let's move on. So calculating a value for delta G, we know that the formula is minus ZF E cell. Number of moles of electrons transferred from my equations is 1. Faraday's constant, which is given to you 96500 coulombs per mole. And we've just calculated a value for E cell. So that is going to be minus 1 times 96500 times plus 0.03, which comes to, plug that into your calculator, minus 2,900 joules per mole. And to convert that to kilojoules, minus 2.90 kilojoules per mole. Once again, for a spontaneous or feasible reaction, we require the Gibbs energy change to be negative, and that's the case. So this reaction is feasible, but it is a very small number which means that very small changes in conditions such as temperature or concentration would have a noticeable effect on the feasibility of this reaction. If this has been useful, hit the subscribe button, the effortless way to support your studies. And by clicking the link in the blurb below, it will take you straight to the Crunch Chemistry School, where you'll find all the resources you need to get that A-star grade at A-level. Together, we can do this.